closet. Amen. Friends, if you will uh, pray with me this prayer of preparation. Oh God, you are our light and our salvation. Living in your presence, we have nothing to fear. Open our hearts to your word this day as we hear the story of the call of the first disciples. Make us ready to follow Jesus on whatever path he leads us. Cast aside our fears and doubts and teach us to trust wholly in you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'm, I'm a little hot if you turn me down just a little bit. Uh, glad to be back with you uh, preaching this morning. I've been in the, in the sound booth since you last seen me, and we're, we're working and getting that team together. Amen. So uh, shameless plug, if you're interested in working with the technology and production team here, just see me after service, and we'll get you, get you plugged in. Uh, but I'm glad to be here because last time I preached before you, I was sick. And so I had zero energy, and I'm, I'm here now. And in fact, I had two shots of espresso this morning. Um, and so for those of you that uh, have folks that have ADHD, you know uh, coffee tends to make them a little bit more hyper. So y'all bear with me. I have a lot of energy today, but uh, we're going to get through this uh, text this morning. I'm, I'm going to be reading uh, one of our lectionary texts uh, this morning. Uh, both of the Old Testament and the New Testament have to deal with uh, God's call. The, the, the um, Old Testament comes from the book of Jonah and is after Jonah had finally uh, decided uh, to listen to God. Uh, you know, he ran, right? They threw him overboard and then he got swallowed by the great fish uh, and then finally decided to listen to God and go uh, answer God's call and go to Nineveh. Uh, this uh, New Testament text is where we're going to pick up. Uh, which is Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 14, going through verse 20. Friends, if you you have it uh, on your phone, you have your Bible with you, I encourage you uh, to read along with me. Uh, It's there on the screen for you. I'm reading from the Common English Bible. Friends, listen for the word of the Lord. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, I jumped ahead. I'm going to start over. I'll jump at uh, 14, 14. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives. Trust this good news. Now, verse 16, as Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. After going a little further, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing their fishing nets. At that very moment, he called them. They followed him, leaving their father. Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us respond by saying, thanks be to God. So we're continuing on this um, theme of following God, following Christ, answering God's call in our lives. So last week, uh, Pastor Josh talked about Samuel hearing God call him in the night, and uh, if you, it's a great story because he goes and he's like, hey, man, did you call me? And there's this kind of struggle of who is talking to me, and I think uh, a lot of us have that struggle at times of trying to discern if, it, if, if it's God's voice, and else once we hear God's voice, we're left with the option to now follow. When I, when I was a kid, I my mom used to always ask me if I wanted to go to certain places, like if I wanted to go with her. And she would go oftentimes uh, go and pay bills uh, late Saturday afternoon or, or, or late Sunday afternoons. And that was when they still had drop boxes and you could write the check and, and put it in there. And my job was to take the check and make sure that it went into the deposit thing and the, the 
the thing rotated all the way around, make sure that it didn't get dropped in there. And now we have online payments, which makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but my mom would always ask me, do you want to go with me? And almost every time, my question would be, where are we going? And she was like, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, do you want to go with me? And I said, yeah, I heard you, Mom, but where are we going? She said, I'm going to ask you again. Do you want to go with me? And I'd be like, yeah, but where are we going? See, in my mind, I needed to know where we were going because I needed to know what do I need to wear. Uh, do I need to, can I, like, stay in my shorts and my T-shirt? Do I need to put on, like, jeans and a polo? Like, what, what's the dress for the occasion, right? Where are we going? I wanted to be prepared for the journey that we were embarking on. From my mom's perspective, she just wanted my company and wanted to know if I'd be willing to go with her without question. And, and, and we find ourselves in the midst of this text in the same kind of situation with Jesus uh, in, in approaching and forming the first four disciples. Uh, uh, Mark the 14 and 15, Jesus begins his ministry by proclaiming the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. Now, folks, we, we have a Wesleyan theological background, uh, a heritage, and, and from this understanding, we dive deeper into the concept of provenient grace. This is a uh, Provenient grace uh, is the grace that, of God that goes before us, preparing our hearts to respond to God's call. So God's grace goes before us. It prepares the way. It prepares our hearts to respond to God's call. This is uh, God's initiative in drawing us towards God's self even before we consciously seek God. Well, what does that mean? So in this, Jesus is proclaiming, look, the kingdom's coming. Get right right now. Get right. Uh, prepare. Repent. Uh, ask for forgiveness of your sins. And now, and believe that this is the good news. God draws us in before we can even, before we even, know of God, before we even see God. Has anybody ever had that, those moments? I know I have. I, I often tell uh, uh, times where there were moments where I was in places I, I shouldn't have been, doing things I probably should not have been doing, uh, and in the middle of it, I break out in prayer. Uh, most often times, these were uh, when I was out doing worldly things, I, I loved sitting in the club and listening to music. And most oftentimes, I would find myself sitting on the top of a woofer in the club, crying and praying to God. And folks think I'm, I'm drunk uh, and just like, what's going on with this guy? I mean, if you just saw somebody sitting on a speaker crying, you'd be like, man, that, he, can't, he can't come here anymore. Uh, but I was often having conversations with God of because I would see something and then God would reveal something to me. And I wasn't even looking for God in that moment in my life. Like, I was like most people in their early 20s, I'll deal with God when I'm over 30. All right? But God in those moments was preparing my heart to receive where God was calling me. And so today, I want to challenge you, where, where is God preparing your heart to respond to God's call? Jesus' message signifies the fulfillment of God's plan. His grace, uh, God's grace, uh, reaching out to humanity and making us aware of his presence and his call to repentance. Then we move on to, to verse 16. And because we we believe so heavily in grace, uh, we see that this con there's another concept that, that comes out uh, that emphasizes sanctification. And this is a process of growth in holiness through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
when Simon, uh, when Jesus rather called Simon, Andrew, James, and John to follow him, it wasn't merely an external call, but it was also an internal transformation. Right when God calls us, right when Christ calls us, when the Holy Spirit calls us, the Triune God calls us. It's not just an outward representation. It's not just an outward thing where we just walk. That's why uh, two Sundays ago we did our, our baptismal uh, covenant renewal, remembering our baptism. And the baptism is an outward representation of what is going on inwardly with our choice to follow Christ. And this internal transformation causes us to believe that it's not just merely an external call, but there has to be an internal change. Friends, we believe in the empowerment of God's grace. And this grace not only forgives our sins, but it empowers us to respond to the call of Jesus. I, I know there's a lot of times in our life where we feel like we just have no power. Right, whether it's what's day-to-day life, whether it's traffic, whether it's uh, folks we're dealing with on the job that we're like, how did you get this job? You don't even know what you're doing and you've been here for forever. Maybe that's just me. Uh, but this gives us the power. We get to make that decision to follow Christ, to respond to the call of Jesus, to leave behind the nets of our old lives and to embark on a journey of discipleship. Is anybody ready to leave their nets of the old life behind? It's a call to become holy and to be set apart for God's service and to participate in his redemptive work. Jesus appeared by the lake with no announcement. These four brothers were minding their own business. They were just trying to, the first two, uh, we believe, uh, historically to be poor uh, because they did not have a boat, uh, and they were uh, fishing from the shore, and they didn't have hired servants. And we see the two, uh, James and John, we see that uh, they believe that they were a little bit more uh, well off because they had a boat, Uh, Their dad was there, and uh, they had hired servants. So Jesus immediately calls people from both ends of the of the uh, social economic spectrum, but he's calling people into this redemptive work. Jesus surprisingly chose these fishermen from a rural fishing village to lead his new movement. Peter and Andrew, again, might have been poorer than the rest, but they, they didn't, like I said, they didn't have a boat uh, like uh, Jane, or, uh, James and John. But that didn't stop them from answering Christ's call. Oftentimes when Christ calls, we, we kind of, well, I'm not ready yet, Lord. Oh, Lord, let me, let me, <laughs> Jesus, let me work on this for just a little bit. Well, let me, let me get this, let me, let me get this right so then I can be right before you. And while that understanding is we want to be right before the holiness uh, and, the, and the righteousness of Christ, uh, of the Lord, of God, uh, the reality is we do not have the power to do that ourselves. We, we cannot make ourselves right on our own. We have to do it through Christ. And so uh, Christ says, come follow me. And their role was not merely to be passive followers. Right? Our role as followers and disciples of Christ are not merely to be passive followers. But to be fishers of all people. Some translations say fishers of men. And that's what Jesus desires for us to to help us go catch people and bring them to Christ. Uh, This can be heard uh, one of two ways. 
as fishers of people. First, possibly Jesus asking his followers to offer all they have to him personally and financially. All right, see, they just left everything. Christ called them, and they left their nets on the shore and then left their father and the staff in the boat. Now, in Jewish custom and culture, this would have been seen to be outright uh, crazy. All right, this would have been outrageous. Like, what are you, what are you doing? This is a, uh, most oftentimes you followed what your father's father did. The second way to look at this is to be called fishers of people. And that echoes profoundly the words of the Old Testament prophets prophets who used fishing metaphors with reference of drawing people back to God. Friends, God has a desire for us as the disciples of Jesus Christ followers of Christ, to help reconcile God's people back to God. Jesus was more than likely aligning his own followers with the covenant and the promises of God. And he was not moving them in radical new directions, but rather making a mid-course correction and bringing them back to a scriptural position. And this is no different than the other prophets that God has sent before uh, that had said, hey, children of God, Israel, pay attention. God desires more for your life. Rabbis called people to learn and follow the Torah. Jesus was calling people to follow God. See, Jesus himself was calling them individually, personally. All right, so rabbis, the students sought out the rabbi. But in this case, the rabbi sought out the student. Then we move to verse 19 and 20. The transformational power of Jesus is alive and well in this text. Uh, We witness that uh, the disciples immediately leave everything to follow Jesus. Now, friend, I don't know about you all, but I don't, I, it's really hard for me to imagine leaving everything. Like, everything, including family. If you're, you're like me, family is very, very close and very, very important. You can mess with a lot of things, but if you mess with family, there's going to be some smoke and we're going to have some problems. These brothers, these disciples, not even disciples yet, but just decided to follow Jesus and leave everything. They left their homes, they left their jobs, they left their money. And oftentimes if we saw somebody do that, uh, uh, and particularly we see that a lot with folks that decide they're going to do, go be world missionaries. And often the response I've always, I've, I've heard uh, is, boy, that couldn't be me. Man, uh, I don't know how you're going to do that. Wow, that's, that's got to be God talking to you. Uh, but, but oftentimes God is calling us to leave not, uh, uh, let me say this, whatever God is calling you to leave, whatever that everything is, that's between you and God. But I believe that at some point that's universal for all of us is that God is calling us through Christ to leave everything in the old life, to come and gain everything in this new life. Uh, just as the, the uh, um, disciples... 
follow God, we also too can uh, follow Christ and experience this profound change when we follow Jesus. And when we experience this change, we believe that there's a possibility of moving in towards Christian perfection. We call this perfecting grace. Uh, John Wesley believed that in this lifetime we could be perfect. Now, theologically, I have a whole lot of arguments with that because I just know where I am, and I don't know, uh, I, you know, I don't believe I can ever just be that perfect in life. But I believe that we could be perfect in Christ, meaning that whatever we move towards, uh, whatever we desire, that our hearts start moving to that of what God desires for us. That's where the perfection comes in. We start, we stop desiring what we want. And we start desiring what God wants. And in this perfection, where God's grace enables us to love God and others completely. Can you imagine what it would look like to really uh, love others completely? To s- love others and see others in the light, in the image of God, the way God sees people? We're dealing with conflicts all over the world because one side sees the other side as the other, as the enemy. What would it look like, friends, if we started sparking conversations, we started sparking change as believers in Christ, that no, no, they are not the other. They are us. We are them. Because God has united us all through the power and blood of Christ Jesus. Friends, we witnessed the disciples leaving everything. But one thing that stood out to me uh, in this text, while before uh, the second, uh, the second uh, brothers, James and John, they were mending their nets. They were mending their nets. That means it infers that something has been, was wrong with the net, whether it was torn or uh, they were just doing uh, uh, precautionary uh, maintenance on it, on those nets. But it let me know that things weren't in working order. How many of us are trying to mend things in our lives when Jesus just happens to stop by? What nets are you mending um, this morning? Is it the net of your finances? If it is, Jesus said, follow me. Is it the nets of your marriage? Jesus says, follow me. Is it the nets of your children's behavior or the nets of your uh, uh, problems in your uh, relationships with parents or extended family or even friends? Friends, Jesus said, follow me. Are you trying to repair the nets of trauma of life experiences or perhaps self-doubt or addictions or even self-destructive choices? Friends, Jesus said, follow me. And I just stopped by this morning to tell you that Jesus is the one to mend the nets of your lives. When we follow Jesus, the things in our lives will be mended and will be made whole. Eugene Peterson says this. From the message translation, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, He'll do it. Friends, the offer and the promise is there. However, the question is, the question of this hour, of this day, 
Will you come and follow Christ? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.